terms of chemistry, what similarities would be, we, we be expected to see if we found alien life? You know, what are the other sort of chemical substrates that might work, Jack? Yeah, well, that's a fantastic question. Uh, we, uh, we know that in terms of the membranes, you can make membranes out of lots of different molecules. That, you know, they, as, as long as they have one part that is, is sort of oil loving and one part that likes to be in the water, you'll make membranes. So it gets more interesting when you think about the nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, what else could work? And through the efforts of synthetic chemists, we now know there's a whole large family of related molecules that apparently could work perfectly well as genetic molecules. The only catch is, most of them at least, it's not obvious how, you, how they could ever be made on the early Earth. But there are, there are a couple of alternatives. There's one called TNA that people are excited about studying. And so if we found a form of life that used a, a similar but, but chemically distinct nucleic acid, that would be pretty exciting. Are there places on Earth where we could test some of the hypotheses about life existing on Mars, places that are as rugged? Yeah, uh, there are Mars analogs. The closest uh, is the Atacama Desert. I think we've got a picture here somewhere. Uh, uh, visited there some years ago. And it looked uh, at first as though nothing could live. This is the dry core of the Atacama. It looked that uh, because we all think that life, at least as we know it, requires liquid water. There is no liquid water. It never rains there. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's very, very dry in that inner core. Uh, and it seemed impossible that anything at all could live there. And it's uh, salt. It, it's a it highly salt environment. It turns out that even there, uh, there are organisms that eke out a living in these pillars of salt. Uh, they, so these are, this is a, a, a vaporite uh, lake, so these are salt structures. And inside the salt, uh, there's a, a phenomenon that I learned when I was about 15 called deliquescence, you see, and that, you think, has anybody heard of that? I don't know if people learn this stuff these days. Deliquescence, and what it means is, you know, on a, on a damp day, you can't shake the salt out of the container because it absorbs water vapor from the air and gets sort of sticky. So salt has that possibility that you can suck in water vapor and retain it in the matrix of the salt. And these little critters live inside this salt, uh, and they've got just enough water molecules to do their stuff. Uh, they get it from the salt. Uh, they get it from the salt, but they need photons because they photosynthesize. So when the sun comes up, they think, aha, we got the photons, but oh no, it's going to evaporate the water out. And so they have, there's a sort of sweet spot, it lasts for about an hour, when they can, you know, have a party, and then they have to <laughs> go dormant until the next time. And so even there, and, and maybe on Mars, there's something like that. Join the party, Jack. Well, I, I'd like to make a point about this. There are all kinds of incredible extreme environments like that on Earth that are populated with all kinds of weird living organisms. But that doesn't mean that life could get started in any place like that, right? The, the environments where life could get started are probably much, much more restricted. And then once you, can, once you have Darwinian evolution going, of course, you can start to adapt to different environments and sort of gradually explore and colonize uh, the whole planet. But your question in terms of, of whether a, an exoplanet might have life depends on does it have those environments where life could actually get started? 